This talk is basically about the Inca, but it's not covering the history of the Inca per se from a conventional viewpoint. It's just that everything in Cusco and the Sacred Valley of Peru is prescribed by archaeologists as being Inca. And the local people who live there also believe, in general, that the Inca built everything in Cusco and the Sacred Valley. But from my first wanderings around the city, I noticed completely different forms of technical expertise from reasonably rough to almost surgical precision. And any time I would ask the, um, the tour guides, you know, uh, you know, how do you explain that? They would simply say, we have to go here now because they literally didn't know and didn't want to answer the questions. So basically, this is a, you know, a comical representation of how some people regard the Inca, not as being simple human beings, but as being these superhumans um, in antiquity. What we do know is that the Inca left the area around Lake Titicaca, which is south of Cusco, about the year 950. And so through the archaeology and oral traditions, the question is, where did they come from? Basically, we know they came from the area around Lake Titicaca, but where precisely is open to conjecture. One place is the Island of the Sun, which is on the Bolivian side, and this is Inca architecture. We know that because pottery has been found, which is of solely Inca, and by, by um, seeing the designs on the pottery, we know that this was built by the Inca, probably just before they left Titicaca or when they expanded their territory and moved back into that area. And this again is another example. What you can see is you see basically field stone that's been stacked. Um, often what they also did is they didn't have concrete, but they had clay that they could use, which, was, which is what the the basic area is made up of throughout Peru, and so they would use that as mortar. This is on the island of the moon, which is next to the island of the sun, and this again is true Inca architecture. You can see field stone with mortar made up of this very fine clay-like mud, and then what they would also do um, in buildings that they wanted to adorn, they would apply almost like a stucco, and uh, the trapezoid figure and the step uh, style are two aspects which archaeologists, you know, identify positively as being Inca in style. Another possible candidate is Tiwanaku, which is on the southern shore of uh, Lake Titicaca. The problem is this: everything in this picture you can see, aside from the megaliths, the standing stones was reconstructed in the 1960s out of what was lying in the area. So this was an attempt to replicate what it looked like without actually knowing what it looked like. But you can see this is megalithic in nature. And the most famous um, artifact in the Pumapunku Tiwanaku area is this. Uh, it's called the Sun Gate. One thing you'll notice about the Sun Gate is the major split diagonal there. And that's how it was found in the 19th century. It was found broken in half and half sunk into the mud. And this is the neighboring site. It's actually part of the same site, but it's given a different name. And this is Pumapunku. And it's here where we find incredible precision, as if machine tools were used, possibly, according to Arthur Posnansky, up to 15,000 years ago. So the original building of the Tiwanaku Pumapunku area had nothing to do with the Inca, because the Inca, we know, go back about to 900 AD and possibly, or obviously before that, but not as far back as 15,000 years ago. This is the type of precision that we find at Pumapunku. Th that channel that was carved there and those holes were clearly done with machines. I've taken engineers there and they are completely bewildered. The common thought by um, archeologists and anthropologists is that the Inca only had, up until the time that the Spanish conquered them 
1533 that they had uh, copper chisels, bronze chisels, and stone hammers. You cannot achieve that level of um, accuracy with those tools. And that's why the Tiwanaku Pumapunku area are so obscure. This is an example of, of how uh, some German engineers replicated what they thought some of the stones at Pumapunku looked like originally before they, uh, the site um, underwent massive um, destruction, mainly due to later tribal people coming and recycling the materials. And these are the people who have been found at Tiwanaku. This, of course, goes back to my talk about um, these enigmatic people with elongated skulls, but these skulls have been found in abundance in the Tiwanaku Pumapunku area. However, they're no longer on display, not even one of them in the museum there. Now, the oral tradition states that um, Manco Kapak and his wife, who was also his queen, uh, and his sister uh, traveled fr uh, triumphantly from Lake Titicaca and founded the city of Cusco. However, the reality behind it is the fact that they were forced out about the year 950 because the area of Tiwanaku, and that would include um, the island of the sun and moon, underwent 50 years of massive drought. It was the result of an El Nino effect that went completely crazy. And so a tribal people, the Aymara, saw the weakness and attacked um, these people who would become the Inca and f uh, forced them to flee. Now they traveled north. None of the oral traditions nor the Spanish Chronicles state why they traveled north rather than south or east or west. I think they were following a road that already existed. And this is how the Inca are depicted. All of these drawings or paintings were made after the fall of the Inca Empire, more than 90, or civilization. More than 90% of the Inca royalty died as the result of a civil war prior to the Spanish arrival. And that's why it was so easy for the Spanish to conquer. The Spanish were not very, you know, super intelligent people or noble or great warriors. The whole Inca civilization was in complete disarray and decay, and the Spanish took advantage. So this is what the Spanish king, um, he asked his painters, probably in the 16th century, or maybe even 17th century, to paint the Inca, but there were no royal people left, so the artist probably just saw people on the street and made a montage. But it's doubtful that the Inca actually looked like this. They, the men did not have long hair. This is more realistic. You see this person, this is a drawing, a very early uh, Spanish drawing, and you see that, uh, that this Inca has very short hair. Now, where they were bound was what's called the Sacred Valley of Peru, and that's outside of Cusco. The reason it's called sacred is because it's incredibly productive um, in terms of agriculture, and probably has been for thousands of years. So for a people fleeing from a place where food could barely be grown, this would obviously become named the Sacred Valley. The question is, did they know it was there, or were they simply following this road that led in that direction? This is the type of, uh, this is the Wari culture that preceded the Inca, who the Inca conquered. And again, you see uh, dry stacked stone, sometimes with a clay mortar mixed in. It's not sophisticated, in terms of construction. But this is what the Inca would have encountered. About an hour's drive south of Cusco on this ancient road, which is now the major thoroughfare, this is an example of Inca-style construction. Again, it's uh, basic stone mixed in with clay mortar. But this is megalithic construction multi-ton blocks fitting together without mortar whatsoever, and in most places you can't fit a human hair in between these joints. This man is Dr. Arlen Andrews. He's an engineer from the United States, and I took him there, and after he um, spent at least two hours there, I asked him and I said, could people with uh, bronze chisels and stone hammers make this? And he said, no, that's impossible. He couldn't explain how this was made or who made it. I believe that this megalithic construction was there when the Inca arrived.